This episode is brought to you by Kia's first three-row all-electric SUV. The Kia EV9. With available all-wheel drive and seating for up to seven adults. With a zero to 60 speed that thrills you one minute. And available reclining lounge seats that unwind you the next. Visit kia.com slash ev9 to learn more. Ask your Kia dealer for availability. No system, no matter how advanced, can compensate for all driver error and or driving conditions. Always drive safely. Listen to the 48 Hours podcast for shocking murder cases and compelling real-life dramas from one of television's most watched true crime shows. Go behind the scenes of each episode with award-winning CBS News correspondents and producers in Postmortem, a weekly deep dive. Listen to 48 Hours wherever you get your podcasts. My child did the... (laughs) Zach, you'll say instead of saying like, oh, he's a music man, you'll say he's a music man. He's a music man, yeah. My child did that. My oldest did that with zero context. <laughs> did you think I had infiltrated your No, I was just like, mind? what the hell? Have you been listening to Cinephobe? <laughs> Rated E. I talked to my parents for a long time yesterday. My mom was like, I love, like, Cinephobe's become my new favorite podcast. I was like, holy shit, that's awesome. It's kind of weird. That's, so she was telling me the episode weird. she's li- she's listened to or whatever. I was like, oh, you got to listen to the Fanatic episode. Actually, you got to watch the Fanatic. And so she did. Last <laughs> night, she watched the Fanatic and she listened to the episode and she is blown away by John Travolta in that movie. <laughs> Just like could not believe what he tried to pull off. I mean, we all were. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, she's, yeah, welcome to the party, pal. <laughs> I don't think anyone watched that and said, I buy it. <laughs> I thought of something because I was listening to the, the episode and I realized, man, we are some foul mouth, you know what? So we are some potty mouths. And, you know, we're trying to sell this podcast oui. to bigger networks, uh-huh. to bigger sponsors. And, you know, I just feel like the language, a little harsh. So I came up with an idea and I, I want to see if you guys. Want to try this out? A swear jar. Like a Venmo swear jar. Yes. So we keep track of everyone who swears. Every time you swear, anyone who swears, that's a buck, right? That's a buck. That's a buck for each swear. At the end, we tally it up. The person with the least amount of swears gets the Venmo from the other two guys. If it turns out that two people tied, then they just split the pot. What do you guys think? That sounds like a lot to keep track of. I'll have to keep track of it. I, I have a pen and pad with me right here. I'm down to try it. I'd like a checks and balance system. <laughs> do you mean? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, he can be audited by the listeners. So you guys in Black History Month are going to not trust the black guy. Got it. Okay. We're recording this January 29th. This episode is going to air. <laughs> but, but black History <laughs> Month is halfway over. <laughs> it hasn't even started. <laughs> You guys are just such a rush to get it over and done with. I could not imagine spending three hours on something that I didn't like after (laughs) 10 minutes. You don't like it. You are a weird individual to keep watching. What are you, nuts? You dedicated a week of your life to dislike something? Get a hobby. Knit something. Go for a walk. Previously on Cinephobe. How am I supposed to go back to the me before all of this pain? Excuse me. We're new in town and we've never had sex before. Would you give us a hand? I would have rather seen his cock. Out of way, Bobby! This episode in this movie exists. You bet your sweet ass I saw a lawnmower man. Oh, Teddy. I'll call some guys from my neck of the woods. We're not talking, Brooke, about a couple of queens who know a few grapples. We're talking about Polacks that don't have a goddamn future. You have a stupid heart and a stupid brain. Regular Einstein. You think I'm a coward? You're wrong. I'm not a coward. You're the coward. I'm not a coward. I love cocaine. I do it all the time. I'm sorry, you guys. I don't mean fag like homosexual. I mean fag like retard. I got nukes shooting out of my dick right now. I've got so many nukes. Dick nukes. I mean, look at this buffet of ass. Mouth to dildo, dildo to ass, ass to ass. Hi, Brant. Anal bees. I'm the goddamn talent, Maze. Look, Gene, I've never told anyone this before. My hat! But I can suck my own dick. And I do it a lot. 1038. This movie is shit. You don't know shit. Holy shit, bro. I had the same note, too. 
And I swear to God, both of you guys are the biggest fucking liars in the world. Howdy, howdy, howdy. You should have saved this for the train. All right, au revoir, Luban. Lisa, solid. Oh, I mean, why don't you just be like a regular person and dream about regular threesomes? Like cones. Give me some soul, kids, this baby. Hey, beautiful. Like, oh, dang. Oh, oh, my nose. I can't indulge this comparison to a person that I mean may or may not know in a movie that has nothing to do with this podcast. That's some 20th century shit, bitch. We will tangle ass. Say hi to your mother for me. And you will lose. What's the end game? Okay, now everyone's dead. What is fucking Spence from Ballers? Who cares what the end game is? Garbage! <laughs> Welcome to Cinephone, the podcast. We break down the movies you're afraid to admit you love. I'm Zach Harper. That's Amin Al Hassan. That's Anthony Mays. Don't forget to subscribe to the Patreon. Fuck! What happened? That's one for him. <laughs> this is harder than I thought. <laughs> you were not even supposed to talk and you just yelled a swear word. <laughs> I'm, not even, I'm not even halfway through this intro. Jeez. If you have a submission, submit it. But it needs to be 40% or lower on Rotten Tomatoes for the audience or the critic score. February is Black History Month. Yeah. And this week... On Cinephobe, for Black History Month, we watched the 1986 comedy romance, Soul Man. Whoa. Romance? I just said comedy. I've seen multiple places where they called it a comedy romance or a rom-com. A com-rom. To Americas. Soul Man. <laughs> Feels like it. Soul Man stars C. Thomas Howell, who had been in Red Dawn in 1984 and would be in The Return of the Musketeers in 1989. He was also in The Hitcher, E.T., and he was Pony Boy Curtis in The Outsiders. Stay golden, Pony Boy. I thought he had a, a more illustrious resume than that. I thought I didn't know it was just E.T. Literally started hot. And <laughs> yeah, well, here's the crazy thing. He's still acting oh, yeah. after this movie. It's no, weird. he's not. Yeah, he is. He's got four things coming or in pre or in post-production. He went from like A-list for his first two movies to B-list to C-list in the 90s to D-list to whatever list he's on now. Now he just does everything. Yeah. We also get Ray Don Chong. Oh, man. She was in Commando and The Color Purple in 1985. She was also in Jeff Who Lives at Home in 2011. And for half this movie, I thought she was the woman from Time Cop. She's not. This is a bossa nova. We know we don't have many of those Uh on this podcast. This is absolutely a bossa nova. (laughs) He met her at a party. He's like, oh, my God. That's Ray Don (laughs) Chong. And we're black. History month. Ari Gross, repeat offender who was in Gone in 60 Seconds. He was the car dealership snitch. Oh, what? What? Yeah. Wow. 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 I did not recognize him from anything. Oh, my God. He was in uh, Exterminator 2 in 1984, just one of the guys in 1985. Did you say Terminator 2? Exterminator 2. Uh Common mistake. And Tequila Sunrise in 1988. We also get James Earl Jones from Return of the Jedi in 1984 and Coming to America in 1988. He was making bangers like every two years. Greatest voice of all time. Absolutely. Every line he said in this movie, I kept trying to repurpose it for Darth Vader. Usually, Zach, however, when you credit these people, you usually give them movies that aren't great movies they've been in you usually say something like he was in 1992's meteor man or something like that oh he was a meteor man wasn't he yeah he was yeah well so if they've got like great movies around that time i'll try to include those otherwise Uh, i'm just looking for things that might qualify trying to figure out where they're at in their careers melora harden who you might know as Jan Levinson from The Office. Jan Levinson Gould, I presume. Repeat offender Leslie Nielsen from Mr. Magoo. Oh, man. And Scary Movie 3. Did you, as Leslie Nielsen came on the screen every so often, were you just waiting like, here he comes? 
he's going to say something so dry and hilarious. I was waiting for him to be funny. Did you have the stupid look on your face where you're like, yeah. your, your mouth you're is kind of half of You're like half smiling, like just waiting yeah. for like, here he comes. He's yeah. going to say something. <laughs> yes, the whole time. Like Peter Griffin when when – when they converted to Judaism. Mom, is sodomy illegal if you're Jewish? I hope so, Meg. I really do. It's not, Lois. It's not. Wait, I got a bossa nova. You know, you're supposed to be Jewish here. Wow. 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 <laughs> Also, we get Julia Louis Dreyfus from Beep. Third movie of her career after Troll, the original. Yeah. And Hannah and her sisters. And she was on SNL from 82 to 85. Soul Man is directed by Steve Miner, who was a horror movie director before this. Friday the 13th 2 and Friday the 13th Part 3. What do you mean before this? Relax, Maze. It was all he had done before he directed this movie. Maze is spelled M-I-N-E-R. He also did nine episodes of The Wonder Years and Lake Placid. What would you do? If I sang out of tune, would you stand up and help me get on key? Oh, baby. Nope, nope that's not, that not the words. That was not the words. All I need. Carol Black wrote Soul Man. This is too much. Uh, irony. Carol wrote three episodes of Growing Pains, created Wonder Years, and created the sitcom Ellen. Damn. With her husband, Neil Marlins. This is her only movie, I Wonder Why. Mm. Dude. But she must have liked her experience with Steve Miner because she brought him back for nine episodes of The Wonder Years. Big fan, yeah. That's a crazy-ass resume right there. Yo, that's an incredible... I mean, she doesn't have to work ever again. Growing Pains, Wonder Years, and the show that where a character first came out as gay? I think that was Ellen, yeah. I'm guessing that Kara Black is not, in fact, black. I'm gonna gonna guess that as well. I have not looked for a picture, but I'll I'll just I'll join you on that. You never notice there's a preponderance of white people with the last name black and there's a preponderance of black people with the last name white. No. Is this a bit? Two Americas. Driving in a parkway and parking on a driveway. All right, it is a bit. Synopsis for Soul Man is Black History Month. To achieve his dream. Great, great bit. It's a great bit. <laughs> to achieve his dream of attending Harvard, a pampered teen poses as a young black man to receive a full scholarship. He sure does. Is he a teen? Uh, no, he's wait, not no, a teen. No, he's in college. Yeah. He's, he's going to law school. He's going to law yeah. school. He should be like 22 or something. Yeah. Yeah. Tagline, a comedy with heart and soul. Oh, my God. <laughs> Why on. is the tagline? Hold on, hold on. It gets worse. <laughs> There's another more racist tagline? <laughs> Give me some soul kisses, baby. <laughs> Other tagline. Guess who's coming to college? Ooh. Oh, I, I like no, I, I like that. That's a, I that's like that. a good one. That is actually a good that, one. Yeah, that's well done. I like what you did there. Mark needs a scholarship to get into Harvard. There's one more available for a black student. The problem is Mark's not black yet. That's not a tagline. <laughs> Again, that's a synopsis. Yeah, it's a synopsis. That's and the then, elevator pitch? The whole poster is just the tagline. There's no right. room for pictures. Or anything. And then the last one, he didn't give up. He got down. That's the one I'm looking at right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's on the screen, you know, like the the... the yeah. The picture of him, he's got like a white blazer on. He's leaning oh against an invisible God. wall. Says he don't give up. He get down. <laughs> this is how white people think black people talk. All right. So I found four and a half million dollar estimated budget. And then I found two different box office numbers. One was $27.8 million US and worldwide. The other one was 35. So somewhere in that range. Either way, unmitigated success. Right. Absolutely. Hold on. I found a French poster of Soul Man. Oh, la la. Which has a comedy where the rhythm is in the skin. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and then how to become black, funky, and poor when you are rich, rock, and white. The French, God bless them. Subtlety is not really that thing. Before we jump into the rest of this movie. Was that not a French? I, like, I forgot. It was, it was re- reading French translations right yes the movie's a fucking rental all right oh now i swear oh, <laughs> oh that's a dollar for the old zacaruni a fucking dollar soul man receives 13 percent from critics on 23 reviews 34 percent from the audience on over 6900 ratings too high i mean would you like the positive or the negative reviews What is the glass? Is it a glass half full of racism this time? (laughs) 
Give me the positives. Well, everybody's just thinking about the negative. Well, I think the, the glass is half full. Everybody thinks it's half empty. TV Guide. Amiable, but politically confused. No name attached. I could see why. <laughs> You're going to love this next one. Okay. Caffeinated Clint of Bragg Magazine. Oh. Oh, oh, oh this is a pre-movie hole. <laughs> <laughs> Howell is awesome in this unforgettable comedy classic. No. <laughs> <laughs> the, the offense that Mace took. <laughs> Janet Maslin of New York Times. It's a blithe, silly, good-natured movie. And of its kind, quite an enjoyable one. Of its kind? What do you mean, it's kind, Janet? Then we've got a bunch of user reviews. User David C., three and a half out of five stars. It's amiable. It's genuinely funny. And it's not the demonic white racist movie that a lot of people seem to have gotten riled up about in reviews. Blackface. We get it. It's not okay. (laughs) We've moved on. In terms of actual content and intentions, it is (laughs) well-meaning. It's a sunk cost. At its heart. Appreciate the movie for what it is. You cowards. It's a comedy, not a movie about racism, though it does highlight, albeit in a more delicate manner than it had scoped to, some aspects of the latter. I think C. Thomas did well, and the supporting performances from RDC, JEJ, and AG are equally noteworthy. I was noticing there are a lot of three-name people in this movie. There are. First things first. This guy, he's got to be from Boston, right? The the reviewer? (laughs) For sure. It's gotta be. We've moved on. That's a very Boston thing. We've moved on. Yeah. <laughs> All of us. <laughs> jerk or no jerk, person whose name starts with an initial. Oh. D. Gordon Liddy, C. Thomas Howell. Until you find me a no jerk, I gotta go jerk. Oh, because they're jerks in real life? Is that what you're saying? I think so. Right. User Jack R, five out of five stars, and I'm just mentioning that this one was written in 2019. The opposite of woke. Wow. Wait, hold on. What? That's a positive review? <laughs> yeah, five out of five stars. I'm guessing woke is a negative term for Oh, uh, gotcha. Jack R. Yeah, he's a jack off. User Ka M, five out of five stars. Underrated humorous comment on racism and underrated entertainment. It's not even far-fetched. Read the very real life experiment of John Howard Griffin in the book Black Like Me. Excellent film, and a crime its message isn't out of date all these years later. Brilliant cast, too. Well done, soul men and women that brought this to the world. Oh, my gosh. Black Like Me by John Griffin. He he traveled for six weeks and had his skin temporarily darkened. (laughs) We're not going to go with this believability. User Mark L, three and a half out of five stars. 14%? What rot? Remember, reviewers, a more innocent time when a white guy could pretend to be black and trot out every lame stereotype known to man and mock political correctness, I suppose. I remember remember this being very funny, though, and having Leslie Nielsen's last ever straight acting role. That's not a good reason. I'm not talking about the black face pop. I'm talking about Leslie Nielsen's last straight role. Yeah. Like, I feel like you went out and you got a Ferrari and then you used it to take the kids to, to soccer practice. Right. You got Leslie Nielsen in a movie that's so ridiculous. The only person who was serious was Leslie Nielsen? Come on, man. They could have made him the dad. So John Howard Griffin took large oral doses of a drug called methoxylin and spent 15 hours a day under a UV lamp. Jesus. I'm sure everyone thought he was black after that. User Nick V, four out of five stars, and this was written in 2011. I might be the only person who's ever liked this movie. Somehow, I feel the premise would be better received in today's culture. But you can't argue its originality and its well-acted cast led by a very funny performance by C. Thomas Howell. He thinks 2011, this movie would have been like, yeah. (laughs) Unbelievable. User Shane J, three out of five stars. A lot's been said about the morals for this film, which you can understand with the premise. But for me, I don't find it racist at all. For me, it has heart to it. And a message, especially when you compare it to garbage like white chicks. Oh! The film's quite funny in places, but the humor has def- dated whoa, whoa, this was whoa, the 80s. Whoa. Wow! Now you don't cross the line there, buddy boy. <laughs> User Tiffany F, three and a half out of five stars. A classic is a movie you liked when you watched it, and 25 years later is still a good movie. It's a comedy made in the 80s, of course. It's not going to be anything spectacular. There's no special effects, just great acting and funny writing. It's still funny today. I'm a black person and wasn't offended by this film. Plus, it teaches a lesson in the importance of morals and principles. Job well done. There's no chance that Tiffany is black. (laughs) There's no chance any of these reviewers are black. (laughs) And then last one. 
User Leslie C, three out of five stars. Yes, it's a controversial film with some humor, but all of us have experienced at least one thing in this movie, no matter what your ethnic origin may be. But we all know if some uh, some of us did what Mark Watson did, we would be expelled. Saw this when it first came out, and again with my 19-year-old daughter. The funny thing is, Soul Man didn't even look like an African-American. Oh, my God. So funny. That was the real joke. Negative reviews. At this point of time, my thought on critics not liking stuff is, then turn it off, you fucking weirdo. You have so <laughs> many options. People who watch an entire project to hate on it, man, it is so weird to me. Liz Beardsworth of Empire Magazine. The comedy was out of date before they even made this, no matter how much they try and twist the ending. Twist the ending like her beard. Time out. In the end, however, it's let down by one easy laugh too many. Is it? Isn't it? It just blew the save there in the ninth inning. <laughs> Welcome to Cinephone. <laughs> Steve Crum of VideoReviewMaster.com. Unreal, poli- politically dumb premise with Howl in blackface. Film four. Ultimately, its refusal to tacky- tackle any real issues make this a thoroughly bland American comedy. That I can get behind. Yeah. The reviews that are focusing on the blackface, that's not the worst part. The worst part is there was no real meaningful social commentary. And they, I mean, they did a little bit, but it was kind of like very heavy handed and, yeah. and simplistic. Bob Ross of Tampa Tribune, an insult. Wait, the painter? Huh. Yeah, for real. Paul Adonazio of Washington Post. He sounds black. The pity is, it isn't even outrageous. It's like uh, Mike Tirico. <laughs> Rita Kempley of Washington Post. Of course, simply everyone is completely bamboozled by our hero's disguise. Ooh. Even though he now looks like a Ken doll with liver disease. <laughs> Roger Ebert. Of the Chicago Sun-Times. This is a genuinely interesting idea filled with dramatic possibilities, but the movie approaches it on a level of a dim-witted sitcom. Yep, that's pretty accurate. User Kevin T, one out of five stars. It's weird. I used to like this movie in the 80s and 90s. Back then, it seemed like a movie promoting integration and hating racism. (laughs) It seemed like it was a reasonably good comedy about how racism is bad, but I just watched it again after a long period of not seeing it, and now it actually seems a little bit racist. Oh my god! It now... I am older, less innocent, and more well-read. I have started noticing a few things in the movie that make one feel uncomfortable. There seems to be definite read between the lines undertones of actual racism and pretending not to be racist. I've always loved the song Soul Man by Sam and Dave. I don't know if anyone else noticed this. I would have thought there would be a public outcry and anger if they had heard what I heard on this movie when it first was shown at the cinemas. During the basketball scene, it plays Sam and Dave's Soul Man song. And at the end of the song, I'm sure I can hear a dubbed bit of the song with someone else says the line, quote, be your monkey boyfriend, end quote. The actual song line should be, be your only boyfriend, end quote. Which left me wondering, is it just my video copy that has this dubbed line? <laughs> Was it all on versions of Soul Man movie? Did people hear this when the movie came out and complain about it? Am I the only person who noticed it? Who put this line in the song and why? Because to me, that is the most racist part about this movie. And I only noticed it yesterday. How is the movie allowed to be released with this line in it? I wonder if James Earl Jones knows about it. I wonder why he was in a movie that was supposedly against racism, but has actual real racist undertones to it. I no longer like this movie, even if I liked it when I was younger. So I like the idea of Kevin saying, hey, man, can I borrow your copy of Soul Man? I'm like, yeah, hold on. I- I'm watching it today, but I'll, I'll slide it to you tomorrow. I'm watching it today. Guys, 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 here's what we're going to do. We're going to dub over the last line of the song during the scene where C. Thomas Howell is playing basketball very poorly and getting worked by a black guy who has a great affinity for the sky hook. Oh, he loves it. He's good at the sky hook, too. User Michael A., half star out of five stars. One of the most racist movies I've ever seen. <laughs> User Tommy H, one and a half out of five stars. It's not a funny movie. The fact that it comes off as racist in a goofy way is the only interesting thing about it. Skip it unless you like getting angry at politically incorrect movies. Racist in a goofy way. User Jeremy S, half out of five stars. So dumb and so bad. No way it could get made now with the BS PC correct crap going on. (laughs) Are they mad about that? User Private U, one and a half out of five stars. Anytime you see a movie cover and there's a dude looking at you while casually leaning his back on something, you can be pretty sure you'll be vomiting blood due to all the bad jokes. No exception here. That's an interesting theory. (laughs) Yes, I agree. Yes, I'm with you, uh, viewer who made that comment. User Private You. (laughs) 
<laughs> Super reviewer Devin B, one and a half out of five stars. Last one. What makes a reviewer super? I don't know. Is it like volume? Can you upvote these? No, you can't even upvote. You just like you flag them or not. So yeah, it must just be volume. It's like Rotten Tomatoes gives them a blue check. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what it is. <laughs> blue check Devin B. Soul Man is an embarrassing movie that somehow manages to be simultaneously intentionally and unintentionally racist. C. Thomas Howell plays a pampered rich kid whose parents cut him off just as he's been accepted to Harvard Law School. He takes an overdose of quote-unquote tanning pills, and voila, he's African-American. Add to that a cheap Afro wig, and he gets a fully paid scholarship reserved for African-American students. C. Thomas really doesn't look ethnic at all, though. He just looks like a guy in blackface. Not a lot of laughs in this movie either, intentional or post-ironic. It's just sort of average. Although, the sight of 90-pound C. Thomas punching out two guys who go flying across the room is pretty entertaining. What was it about punching a guy in the 80s that caused him to go flying 20 feet across a building? A completely pedestrian waste of time. Wow, she hit a lot of points that we were going to talk about. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe that's what makes her a super reviewer. She's super thorough. She's just all over it. Yeah, she's super all over it. I think that's what it is. Amin, what's your first note? First note, boys. Oh, yeah. I said, I've never seen this before. You know, I rented this on Amazon Prime and it has a rating and then it'll tell you the rating is for violence, language, sexual situations, da, da, da. The first warning they had there was blackface. I said, I've never seen that before. Whoa. Yeah. I've never seen that either. Yeah. 21st century, ma'am. <laughs> yeah, that is very 21st century, ma'am, going on there. Also, there are a couple of notes from the opening credits in the title Soul Man and in every na- person's name they would make the A black. It'd be white text on a black screen, but the A would be black. Except there's a couple of times that they didn't do the A, which was just weird. Only one time. I didn't check for the also starring. I'm talking about for the main cast in the beginning. It only didn't happen twice in the beginning. One was for someone who didn't have A in their name. Understandable. But the other was for Ari Gross. His was the E. And I'm like, well, why was his E black, not his A? And then I started trying to think of like conspiracy theory, whether the letters are supposed to spell something at the end. And, and, you know, maybe I shouldn't do an edible before watching these movies. I was going to try to do a bit where I was pretending we were watching the movie Soul (laughs) to attempt to not get canceled. My first note was, wait, this isn't animated? Oh, I thought you were going to go really deep into the bit, which is to watch Soul and do all your notes. (laughs) (laughs) My next note, oh no, blues music here feels racist. <laughs> Tip to the goddamn iceberg. This motherfucker really be throwing his socks everywhere, huh? Oh my God, we're in someone's bedroom. Wine glasses, tennis balls, alcohol, socks. bottle, clothes, so- socks. Socks everywhere. Godzilla. Godzilla books. I just cussed. When I wrote my notes, I did not realize we would be playing this swear jar game. So there it is. $2 for Amin, one for Zach. Maze, so far none. No, Zach got an extra one off. Oh, did he? Oh, what? wow. You rat? What are you talking about? Oh, a little it <laughs> departed. Okay. <laughs> we got books and a stereo system shown. It hits noon and blues music starts playing as the uh, as the old alarm. Hoochie Coochie Man. I have a theory that someone at Apple saw this movie. And love that scene. Because why is the alarm on everyone's iPhone? Da na 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 na. Da na 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 na. You guys know what I'm talking about? Yeah. How about that? Mark Watson no? blindly throws a tennis ball and nails the off button while keeping his head under the covers. And I wrote, he's so athletic. <laughs> his alarm clock is a minute behind the stereo. It goes off at noon. Same thing happens. This time he uh, pokes his head out from the covers. Another ball annihilates the clock. And we see that someone's in his bed. He seems confused by it. Checks her face behind the hair. Looks at her body under the sheets. Then his friend Gordon comes barging into the room, jumps on his bed, and straddles him with mail. He mounts him. They're worried about getting accepted into law school. Gordon got in. Mark got in. You son of a bitch. Here's how you know, for our younger listeners, if you got into a school or not. And I get this from Matt Groening, the creator of The Simpsons, right? He used to have this comic strip called Life is Hell. Fat envelope, good. Skinny envelope, bad. Postcard, and on the postcard, it just had the word no on it. 
Uh oh, they're going to law school, Harvard Law School. Uh, seem to have forgotten the girl is there. She congratulates him. Gordon asks for an introduction, and Mark introduces himself to the girl. Ha <laughs> ha. Because he doesn't know her name. Get it? Now we're at a college party. Oh. Julia Louis Dreyfus pulls up with a guy and can't believe Mark and Gordon are getting into Harvard Law. Her guy's going to be you. I can't believe that Julia Louis Dreyfus has literally looked the same for 30 years. Black don't crack? She did the other thing. She went the other way. She did the time honored tradition of, I'm going to look older than I am when I'm young. It was the hair, too, yeah. I'm going to grow into how old I look so that by the time I am old, I look really young. She goes to kiss them hello, but stops just short, even though she's aiming for the lips. It was like a weird air kiss. Yeah, that's that's what they do. Like, I'm not even going to touch you. They. That's what they <laughs> Mark and Gordon are under a table getting high. Mark is describing how they'll make their first million by 30, retire to the islands by 35. No, no, Zach. We make our first mill at 30, <laughs> retire to the islands at 35. These are the mother lovers who have l- messed up our country. Damn, this is not fun. And I have to censor myself. <laughs> this is your game. Cut I the know. check, you coward. I'm not the coward. You're the coward. <laughs> Gordon wants to run for Senate. <laughs> Uh, a friend named Seth is talking about suntan lotion or something. I, was, I didn't really pay attention. Then he passes out. This freaking Australian stoner is apparently a PhD student researching suntan lotion. No, 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 no. He's a PhD student researching exposition. That's what he's doing. <laughs> Mark now is at his parents' house by the pool. His dad's talking about needing to do something for himself. His dad is on an inversion table. Yeah. Oh, my God. Have you ever used one of those? I did. You, go, oh. San Antonio used to have one in the visitor locker room. Oh, they're amazing. I remember. No, they're not. It was just so what? weird. It was oh, weird. It stretches your back perfectly. Oh, I didn't it. stretch my back at all. My back still hurt after that. But also, they do a really cool camera trick thing where the father's perspective as he's swinging back and forth. Really cool? <laughs> no. You mean the dad POV? I like it. I'm a big fan of POV as we've established. <laughs> Gonza, you scouting again? I liked it, but I thought something was going to happen that when he would tilt back one time, C. Thomas Howe would be gone, either fall like fainted into the pool, fell backward, or whatever, or black. And it's like, no, he's or black. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm black, but uh, but he just remained the same, and and I'm just like, well, well, what was the point of this whole thing? I mean, what was the point of the whole movie? His dad wants to give him his manhood, and I wrote tension. Oh, boy. And now I have one more thing that I want to give you. It's the biggest and the best thing that a father could give to his son. Do you know what that thing is, Mark? A Ferrari? Oh, boy. That thing is manhood. Son, I want to give you your manhood. What would that mean in practical terms? I want you to go to Harvard and work very, very hard. I also want you to feel good about yourself. That's why I decided to let you pay your own way. Very, very hard. Okay. Mark says it's not necessary, but dad took the money from his tuition. He bought a timeshare in Barbados. I don't know if the technical tax shelter term for tuition accounts, I don't know if it existed in the 80s, but if it did, there are serious tax implications for what he just did there. (laughs) It's like a 40% like hit. Yeah, but they're rich. They don't That's care. True. But if they're rich, then why why does he need the tuition money to get the, I don't know. Because screw his kid. It's also the 80s and he thinks that a timeshare is a good investment. <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> Vaya con Dios, son. Do they speak Spanish in Barbados? What? I mean, I'm, that wasn't a joke. It was an observation, but go ahead. It clearly wasn't a joke. It wasn't funny. Mark says tuition uh, and fees are over 10K. Estimated annual living expenses are $7,500. Total cost is $53,979 per year. No, not per year. Oh, total? For the entire three years. Oh that's why I was like, why is he like, that's it? Like, I get it, like, inflation and all, but damn, man, you could get a job. And, like, at that moment, I wrote student loans, question mark. Get a job, question mark? He could have gotten himself some sort of job that would have maybe not been a great paying job, but enough to pay for his for his schooling. But who wants to see that movie? I mean, black people. He's standing in front of a noose. This really took me out. There's a lot of great optics in this movie. Gordon hands him a Cabbage Patch doll. He hangs the doll. It's also like a voodoo doll for his dad because yeah. it's got a headband and glasses. And also... The Cabbage Patch doll is incredibly tan, 
and has very textured hair. Just going to throw that out there. Now Gordon's looking up grants and scholarships for Mark to apply for. Gordon finds one for the most qualified applicant in L.A. That's when Mark reads it and sees it's the most qualified black applicant. Henry Q. Bouchard talks to financial aid department. They have aid for someone whose parents are poor, but not assholes. Ha! Huh. That's not how financial aid works. Gordon takes uh, Mark to apply for a loan. Loan officer reads an unpaid water bill for 50 bucks. Pacific Bell for 72. 15 bounce checks, which were just bookkeeping slip ups. He's got a lot of excuses. Shout out to Dot Matrix Printers. Remember those? Yeah, was that a bit? Because they let that, I mean, this movie lets a lot of things go a lot longer than they need to, but they, we're watching the printer print for like 25 seconds. Loan officer isn't going to give him the loan. The bank is finicky. Mark's now on a couch talking about law school slipping away, and he's at therapy. Wants the therapist to say it was a misunderstanding for his advice to the dad and to pay for law school. The therapist is wearing a feel a track suit and starts monologuing his ass off about his own spoiled son. Oh, man. You see, I have a son about your age and he has wants and needs much like your own when he was 14 he wanted a dirt bike <laughs> when he was 16 he wanted a car when he was 18 he wanted college and now he wants a three-bedroom beachfront co-op in rancho palace verdes he just wants and wants and wants i work my ass off to give him everything he wants he always wants more probably wants to sleep with my wife. Uh, doctor, I don't think you Shut want... Shut up! Shut up! You're all alike. You'll, you'll bleed us dry with nothing but bones and when we finally crumble to dust, you'll dance in our ashes and go windsurfing! And it's the guy from ALF. Yes, he's the dad from ALF. That's all I could focus on. That's the dad from ALF. Max Wright. He almost cussed at one moment. I was like, oh, the dad from Alf almost said a naughty word. There's also some uh, Oedipus vibes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, his son, his, son, his son wants to bang his wife. And I was like, Does that, is that his stepmom? Or like- That's a good question. And then there's a photo of the wife that looks like a man in drag. That was a dude. Yeah, she's not hot. I think it was Ari. That was a throwaway joke right there. With sunglasses on. Drive by. And then the waiting room is just a bunch of yuppie dads. Seven dudes in different pastel colored feel track suits and then one dude in all pink. I liked it. I thought that was a nice touch. And all packed together. Sir, your group is here. <laughs> Now Mark and Gordon are drinking at the bar. Gordon says there's a lot of good law schools to apply to. And Mark says, I have five words. For Harvard, there is no substitute. This movie should have been called Legally Black. <laughs> Julia's boyfriend's there, Brad, and says he's sorry to hear about Harvard. He can uh, pull some strings to get him into BU. Mark says he's got the money, and where there's a will, there's a way. He has a secret way. The guy just laughs at him. Mark's screaming at him as he walks away. I'm going to Harvard and don't call me a liar. Gordon asks him where he's going to get the 50K. Cut to a room full of old white people from Mark's POV. They congratulate him on going to Harvard. Cut to Mark. He's in blackface. Says thank you. He'll do his best. By the way, no black people on this committee for the black scholarship. Well, I mean, is Henry Q. Bouchard black or is he a Canadian? Honestly, I thought Henry Q. Bouchard was like... uh a light-skinned black Creole from, from Louisiana. Oh, okay. My next note was, here we go. First 1730 of the movie. <laughs> my, not racist. My next note, here we go. <laughs> oh, up. this is where we did the... Oh, oh my dude, God, dude. I, I had the same, same name, too. Dude. Sick, bro. Sick. <laughs> Gordon is running horribly down the street toward the beach. He runs by Mark unknowingly. Mark runs by him, catches up on the pier waves and gordon awkwardly waves back then mark gets in front of him runs backwards so he can look at him gordon looks uncomfortable doesn't gordon flash him the peace sign he won't make eye contact though finally says hey gordo wait up as he takes off his glasses gordon dumbfounded jogging backwards falls off the pier into the water because a guy opens a gate right at that exact moment yeah. Yeah. <laughs> don't you hate when that happens mark explains that he went to see seth and seth gave him these pills tanning pills chemically tan his skin Gordon says he's not tan, he's black. So shout out to the Stoner Australian PhD student. Dr. Exposition. <laughs> for the hookup on this. An incredible invention, by the way. Like Take pills and you tan? Yeah. Gordo says, I don't believe this. This is unbelievable. I don't believe you. This is really unbelievable. Dialogue. He's got the scholarship for Harvard. It's already done. Gordon says he can't just take a scholarship away from some black person. He hits that CK on black pretty hard. Black. Black. 
Mark, do you realize what this means? You're going to have to be a black man. Gordo, it's going to be great. These are the 80s, man. It's the Cosby decade. America loves black people. Cosby's. Oh, my God. It's the, Co- it's the Cosby decade. <laughs> Cosby decade. Should have gone Eddie Murphy. Are we just ending the Cosby decade? Did we just finish that off? I mean, the 80s. 80s were a Cosby decade. And is this another one that we just <laughs> just ended? Especially for the whites. A different kind of. Yeah. Soul Man plays as they drive around Cambridge, ah, Massachusetts. Ah, they said it. They said it. He gets the check from the foundation of the financial aid office. He checked white or Caucasian for ethnicity. Lady looks at him before whiting it out. White out. Ha. Huh. You guys remember white out? Yeah. Do you remember when it, they went from the brush to like the kind of triangle the sponge? sponge? Oh my God. Game changer. Or the, the pen, right? Yeah. The pen was great too. I didn't like the pen one. Oh, pen. I thought the pen worked fine. The strip, like the tape strip. Yeah. Oh, you know, I didn't like the tape strip. Really? Oh, I loved it. No, no. I, I like the brush because I like the action of, I felt like Michelangelo. I'm just painting, right? And then I like the pen because I felt like I had more control. The strip was just kind of like, it was all, all over oh, the no, place. I thought the strip was great. I pictured you as more of a Pollock. 855 mm. NBA jump if you like the pen or the uh, or the brush yeah. better. What do you think those companies have done? Those companies that were making white out by the gallon. Now, now they're Isn't that just 3M or something? Like they're Vic made white out. They're still making pens. Yeah, Vic. Is Vic doing okay? I don't know. Do people write? Aaron wrote in a card to me the other day. What'd she write? Just happy birthday wishes. What the card already says happy birthday in it. No, and then she wrote like a personalized note for it. What'd she say? Happy birthday, babe. Thank you for being my rock this year. You're one of the most loving, kind, and generous people I've ever met. And I'm so lucky to have you in my life. I love you, and I'm so proud of you. Wait. You're going to have a wonderful year. Love, Aaron. She said you're one of the most loving and kind people she's ever met? Yeah, I am. Where did she grow up? Like the... the she almost did it. Almost with another uh, uh, dollar in that jar. <laughs> did she grow up in the orphanage where Annie grew up in? <laughs> I'm nice to people. Who? Not you. Aaron. Aaron. People I like. <laughs> like, I'm nice to Aaron. People I'm sleeping with. But no, even, I, I refuse to believe that your level of niceness when you're trying to be nice elevates to a level where anyone would say one of the nicest people. Like, Why just- would you write in his birthday card, you're <laughs> one of the 32 That's my thing. nicest people in my life? <laughs> you're one of the top 100 nice people. <laughs> That's my thing. That's why I don't, by the way, that's why I don't believe in birthday cards or happy birthday, any of that stuff. Cause people say things that clearly aren't real or are true. <laughs> like there's no way Zach qualifies as one of the nicest, kindest people that Aaron has ever met. Why not? I mean, is running the plus minus on your niceness, what? Zach? Hold on, you fucking asshole. I am too. Oh, well, that's <laughs> two of those in there. Okay. Now Zach takes the lead. Four bucks to three. May's still got one. I have a question. I've got an answer. Does eat a dick count as a swear? <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> we're ranking in the dough, baby. <laughs> and away, baby. And away, baby. <laughs> What's up, cinephobiacs or cinephobe listeners or whatever you want to call yourself. If you're a listener, cinephobe, maybe you're just calling yourself a CTD fan. I don't know. That's not the point. We want to tell you about a fun new thing we're doing every Thursday on the Stereo app. Stereo app is a live social conversation app where you can be a co-host. You can be part of the conversation. You can just listen, whatever you want to do. But what you can do is support us and have fun with us and interact with us on the Stereo app Every Thursday for Count the Dings, we're going to have Cinephobe content. We're going to have mailbag content. We're going to have after shows for the Cinephobe episode that just came out that week. You know, we put stuff out on Wednesday, Thursday night. Boom. A Cinephobe after show. Talk about all the stuff that happened in the recording, all the stuff that maybe we couldn't say. You'll get an exclusive right there on the Stereo app. And it's easy. Just download the Stereo app and follow me at Stereo.com slash Talk Hoops. Follow Amin at Stereo.com slash Talk Darth Amin. We're all on there and we're all going to have these fun, interactive after shows. It's like a live show, but it's on the Stereo app. And the way you can really help us is when you go to Stereo.com slash Talk Hoops or Stereo.com slash Darth Amin, make sure we're the first show you listen to. Again, we're starting it this week, every Thursday. Download the app, 
Download the Stereo app in whatever smartphone store you got and come check us out as the first show you listen to Thursday night. You're going to help us out. You're going to be able to get some extra content and we're going to have a lot of fun. It's a lot of interactive. Talk to us, ask questions, make fun of us, whatever. And we'll talk about how much we hate each other from that week's episode of Cinephobe. So make sure you hang out with us on Stereo.com slash Talk Hoops, Stereo.com slash Darth Mean. Follow all of us. Get notified every time we go live. Let's have some fun like it's a live show, baby. Where the hell are we? I don't know. It's Black History Month and you're reading birthday cards. The landlord isn't happy with Gordon's roommate being black. Roy McGrady. Racist McStereotype, as I call him. <laughs> Gordon mocks him about it. Mark looks out the window, sees Leslie Nielsen, uh, who's Mr. Dunbar. Uh, Mark likes his daughter. Mark starts remarking about, whoa, I like things are starting to look better. And I'm like, because Leslie Nielsen got out of a car. <laughs> and that's what I wrote. Tension. Mark likes the daughter. Dunbar, Dunbar tells the landlord, look for any break in the lease opportunities. Pets, damage, drugs, loud music. Cue the loud music, extreme close-up of a joint being lit, Gordo hammering the wall, saying they should get an ocelot. Four for four. I laughed. Hit for the cycle. They're at the Harvard Law Mixer. Gordon is in paradise. And they're near two white guys who are telling racist jokes. <laughs> Ten black guys and one white guy. What do you call the white guy? I don't know. Quarterback. <laughs> you got a thousand black guys and one white guy. What do you call the white guy? I give up. Gordon! <laughs> oh, sorry. Look, no offense, really. Just a joke. These fucking guys. Okay, so it's not until... I mean, that's a swear. Way late in the movie that we learn their names are Barky and Bowie. What do you call... You gotta... You gotta... You gotta don't say it, Zach. Just, just flip it, Maze. <laughs> Zach, I, I care about you. As one of the nicest people I've ever met in my life. <laughs> I care about you. Mark spots Ray Don Chong as Sarah. She walks over to introduce herself, says the first BLSA meeting is Thursday. He says it's the date. She says, no, it's not. Now they're at orientation. Mark loves the law. I love the law. I love being black. I love this woman. Maybe we needed a little bit more exposition. <laughs> like you met her. She said, hey, meet me at this thing. It's a date. No, it's not. And she walks out. At some point then, don't you kind of have to do some more interactions between the two of them before he can declare that he's in love with her? Also, Mark has jungle fever. Can you say that? I, I can say it, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Black History Month. He spots James Earl Jones, says he wants to take criminal law now instead of next semester because he found out the prof is a brother. And I wrote, you're my brother. And he's got a shit-eating grin on his face. Yes. Oh, one. yes, he there's does. One. And there's, there's one. Oh, there it is, Maze. Oh, boy. Welcome to Snitchophobe. I like how it just all it's turned into is us pointing <laughs> out. Us blowing rape whistles. <laughs> Here's one right here. By the way, just for all you white people, just so you know, when the professor is black, that is an absolute super duper unquestioned red flag because that means he or she will treat you harder than anybody else in the class. Don't I know it. That is the legacy of black professors with black students because you got to work twice as hard. If Mark had known at all any black people, that whole situation could have been avoided. Don't you think, once again, this whole movie could have been avoided if he knew a single black person? <laughs> Cut to class. James is taking roll. Calls Mark's name and he replies with right on. He hits on Sarah some more. She's not thrilled. James warns the class that the year won't be easy on them. That right on, by the way. Oh, my gosh. And another <laughs> shit-eating grin. There's one. He has to be fully prepared. All the work must be on time. No excuses. Mark tries to whisper to Sarah. That's what he tells his wife when they go to bed. James looks up at him. You have anything to say, Mr. Watson? Fantastic crazy eyes on Professor Vader. Oh, my God. Professor Vader has a lot of crazy eyes moments in this movie. Leaving class, Mark offers to help or time to talk with Sarah. She walks away, and he says, what an ass. And she says, what an... I don't want to get fined. Well done, Zach. I don't think quotes should be allowed. No, we're guys, I'm telling you, we're going to sell this pod for a million dollars because it'll, it'll be wholesome and family friendly. <laughs> I swear to God, if you think that this million dollars is coming from Chris Cody and Mike Ryan because of their stock market, <laughs> that's AMC, baby. <laughs> we're going to be doing these at an AMC. Yeah, you're right. I mean, 70 episodes in, let's toss out the playbook. They'll play our pod right before a movie starts. Let's only do PG movies from now on. Mark asks Gordon what BLSA 
is as they share a banana for some reason mark says black law students association probably a real militant crew whoa dude he takes mark's already bitten banana dunks it in coffee and then takes a bite tension is it tension or does that essentially if he's done with said coffee does it wipe away what mark's put on it that's more than tension i'm gonna tell you that right now that is more than tension. Cut to Mark dressed in camo pants, a black turtleneck, and a beret. As the theme from Shaft plays. Oh, Lord, was my only note here. The Jimmy out loud, I went, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. Humming a humming a humming a humming He walks <laughs> He walks in, and everybody is dressed business casual. He asks if someone called for a cab. Comes back to the apartment, mad at Gordon, who laughs at him. They look out the window. Dunbar's daughter is moving into the building. Whitney introduces herself to Mark and Gordon. Dunbar grabs her, interrupts, and walks her to the building. I want you to stay away from him. Why? Because he's black? No, because I say so. And just like I'm that. sure that'll work out. Cut the guys playing basketball and someone practicing a sky hook. Oh. He nails it, by the way. Yeah. So there's two guys with a clipboard who argue over who gets Mark. And one of them is Ronald Reagan's son, Ron Reagan. Okay, so I saw in the credits someone named Ron Reagan and I said, ah, parents must have been a big Ronald Reagan fan because he was an actor. I actually made that noise. Uh-huh before i made that point ronald reagan saw this movie <laughs> but he didn't know what he was watching so it doesn't matter yeah he asked, have you ever played before he says on the playground and then they fight over the clipboard some terrible banter from these guys have you ever played pickup where someone had a clipboard no to figure out what the teams were no ron reagan thinks his name is marcus washington that was actually really funny okay fillmore you can take matthews we got washington here on the coin toss so he'll take leon that's watson right Sorry, Marcus. He's got to guard the other black guy, Leon. Mark is awful at basketball. Leon throws a behind-the-back pass that mesmerizes Mark. He tries and it goes right to Leon. He hits a sky hook. Mark tries a sky hook, throws it out of bounds. During this entire scene, they're playing Soul Man, and I said, ah, ah, they said it. They, they said it again. It. <laughs> and everything is in slow motion. And when they do these montages to music, they really just oh my God. let the music play Breathe. all the way <laughs> until the end of the song leon dunks mark wedges the ball leon is working mark mark hits uh, his own balls trying to drill between his legs ha this is the part where i noted that the reviewer who thought they said your monkey boyfriend it actually says funky boyfriend so he was wrong Shocker. back to class students are getting james questions wrong mark gets it wrong saying the precedent in the case is ronald reagan ah. i am not a humorless man but if you're going to take up my class time making jokes, please see to it that they are funny. I thought about, like, Darth Vader saying that to Luke Skywalker. Leaving class, Mark commends her on uh, getting it right, wants to get together. She asks if he wants to storm the administration building. He apologizes for the BLSA meeting. Maybe we could just phone in bomb threats instead. Ha! Ha! She says there's something strange about him and doesn't know what it is. <laughs> Think a little harder, Sarah. She only has time to study. He can drill her. Quiz her. I could drill you. Quiz you. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Love those verbal faux pas, huh? He agrees to study with her Friday night. Says it's a date. She says it's an appointment. Gordon is uh, talking about feeling up some girl. Mark wants to grow dreads. Then Julia and her boyfriend Brad are behind them. She notices Gordon. Gordon! They keep walking. Gordon says not to use his voice. Gordon! Mark puts on sunglasses, turns around, doing a Stevie Wonder impression. Oh, my. Yeah. Oh, my. Gordon says he's not blind, just dumb, just a little deaf. Oh. Gordon introduced him as Kareem Abdul-Jali. Nice to meet you, Kareem! Is he Muslim? No. He's Canadian. I laughed. <laughs> he's looking for work. He was a Mountie. Not a lot of Mountie work here. Gordy is a bad liar, dude. Gordy's a bad liar, but also it's telling. They couldn't just lie and said, yes, he goes to school here. <laughs> Like, they, he's like, a black guy going to school here? No. No, no, no. He, he's <laughs> no, a Mountie. Looking for work. A Canadian Mountie looking for work who's blind, deaf, and dumb. Helen Keller. Boyfriend Brad is now a potential transfer. Just needs someone to drop out or quit. Helen Keller, not to be confused with Helen Hunt, who just is blind. <laughs> Too soon. This is some solid character motivation for Brad here. He does not act on it. Well, he does kind of at the end. They leave. Mark says he handled it very well. <laughs> Dunbar's daughter asks Mark to change the washer in her shower. She likes him. Goes to Radcliffe, poli sci major. She shows up at his door in a pink leotard holding a wrench. And the tension while she's giving him the fuck me eyes, yeah, count it. She wanted to get wrenched. Wow. Nice. 
She says she's writing her thesis on American civil rights movement. He says he loves civil rights. That's an incredible coincidence. <laughs> yeah. He said, oh, it's an incredible coincidence. And at first I thought like when he said, oh, I thought I was like, wow, he's really like diving into the black person role to be like, yo, that's just too much. You're doing too much, trying too hard. Instead, his dumbass forgets he's black. I love the civil rights too. Smash cut to Mark smashing the cut. Yeah. You banged her. I could really feel 400 years of oppression and anger in every pelvic thrust. Oh. That was unbelievable. I laughed. That was incredible, Mark. She wants to use it in a short story called Shades of Grey. It doesn't feel like there's black or white. Just ah, shades of gray. Ah, she said it. She said it. <laughs> <laughs> Is this the genesis of 50 shades of gray? Is she going to bang 49 more black dudes? Maze, you got to clip my she, my joke and Zach's laugh to after when you just said it. Because that was great what you just said. But, like, it was just out of order. That's a little, I don't know. <laughs> Keep all this in. <laughs> You can just laugh when I say something funny. <laughs> not make me have yeah, to edit in our laughter. previous laughs to my joke. <laughs> I just thought it was a good joke, but it just got stepped on. And I didn't, want it, th- to, I didn't want it to happen. No, this cleared it up real well. She likens it to stereotypes about black men. Some are true, some aren't. What about penis size isn't. Mm. Wants him to meet her parents at dinner before he says no. Wants to tell him what's for dessert and she, she blows him. How about this for dessert? Is a blowjob the dessert? I mean, for her. I feel like it's more of an appetizer, to be honest with you. Sometimes it's a whole meal, boys. <laughs> <laughs> Fast food. <laughs> A lot of nut drive through. <laughs> Quick cream. You, 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 you. Ready? Oh Ready my god! Let me stop. <laughs> Let me stop before. <laughs> There's already. We already yeah, have so many left swears, but somehow they have the same effect. <laughs> we have so many Levitard listeners now that if I make any sort of joke that I'm about to make right now, it oh just, my god! Like I, I'm gonna tell you right now, if you're a Levitard listener and you've come here, and thank you for coming on and. And listening to Cinephobe. We're not doing phrasing. Now I'm in a place where every time I tweet anything, there's at least one person who responds, oh, you mean like porn? I'm like, at least make it witty. I had a great tweet to you the other day. Juju tweeted out the Spider-Man meme, the pointy meme. Said something like, be careful, Darth Amin. It's a dangerous game. It was a Spider-Man thing. That's pretty good. That's, That's good. But most people don't do that. Most people are just like, you mean like porn? Uh, are you going to post a Spider-Man meme now? Like Dan always praises these people for being so creative and witty and funny. And they make these songs and they do great looks likes. And then they come in my mentions and all of a sudden they're all just that word that Maze likes to say a lot. Zach, I feel like I have to step down from Cinephobe because I didn't know we were going to be doing it with Kurt Rambis in 2021. <laughs> I mean, that's not good either, but it's a little better than what they've I like the <laughs> cut to dinner. Black server glares at him as he passes out dessert. Oh. I would too. This scene is, oh, oh my God. This is a scene. Yeah. So mom offers dessert. He says he can't eat another bite. Then cut dish her picturing him with his shirt open, a knife in his mouth, saying he's only been able to think about white women as their jungle sounds play. All my life, I've only been able to think of one thing. White women. <laughs> she imagines him tearing her dress off. She likes She's it. aroused. Tension. Then the little brother is watching the portable TV. Little brother's name is Bundy Dunbar. (laughs) That is a name. He pictures Mark as Prince. And I wrote, what the bleep is happening? Tension? Was he watching Little Richard? Yes. Question, is this kid gay for Prince? Well, hold on. Is anybody not gay for Prince? If Prince was like, let's, you know, alive and was like, let's go. I'd have to know. What are we talking about? Does the power have to do with the size or the strength of the bottom? Now, Dennis, I've heard that speed has something to do with it. Speed has everything to do with it. You see, the speed of the bottom informs the top how much pressure he's supposed to apply. Speed's the name of the game. Mr. Dunbar pictures him as a pimp with watermelon. Don't get my hair over into my hypodermic needle, bitch. Give me some more watermelon while you're at it. Yes, dear. White fat-ass slut. Sarah is studying by herself and she's pissed. Mark gets home. Gordon says that she called and sounded pissed. Wait, why is she pissed? Like, I mean, because he stood, stood her up. up. But it's not like he could have texted her. He could have not stood her up. He could have showed up. <laughs> yeah. That's true. Cut to class. James giving an assignment before Thanksgiving. Sarah got an A minus on the paper. Mark got a C plus. 
Mark asks for a makeup study session. She says to drill himself. Ha! Mm, well done. He will. Now Mark is with Whitney, and she's saying they can work stuff out because they don't have uh, sexual problems. Clearly not. I would, like, push back, <laughs> but I've used that same logic before in the past, so. Yeah. <laughs> what was that, PTSD? <laughs> <laughs> Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> yes, yeah, the lunch lady for Jello with marshmallows, and it's Sarah who turns around, says they're out. She walks away. Surprise! Now, why is she mad if she never was like interested in him in a romantic way? And she saw him with some girl. Clearly, she's not that mad. Oh, she's mad. Oh, she big mad. She was mad. Maze, you don't know this because you're not used to dealing with adults. That's how they do their anger. Oh, okay. they, they don't stomp. They don't stomp and like hold their breath and. and yeah, you're right. I haven't dated many lunch ladies. No, you haven't. <laughs> All right, Mark's now driving. There's a cop following him. He slows below the 25 miles per hour limit. He comes to a complete stop. Signals. Cop follows. Stop at the red light. No, no, no. You skipped them. Sparky and Booey are back. How many black electricians to screw in the light bulb? One to hold the bulb and one to drive the pink Cadillac in a tight circle again. Shame to say, I laughed. <laughs> Wait, you told me not to say the jokes earlier. No, but you got to acknowledge that the joke happens. You can't just skip the scene. All right. Black History Month. Mark's driving. What? Mark's driving. <laughs> <laughs> cop following. I mean, what's a thorough record of everything that happens during Black History Month? We'll stop at the red light. Looks back at the cop. Signals to turn right. Green light. He turns. He's mad the cop is following him. White people love Jeeps. Boy, let me tell you, man. Hold on. Saw a black guy. Driving a Jeep the other Where? day. No doors. Where? North Hollywood. Where? No. Like, nope. less than a mile from my place. Nope. Nope. Not not black. He must have been C. Thomas Howell. He was black. Mm. I'm glad we let that sit for a second. Second note. <laughs> that's the worst feeling in the world when a cop is behind you. Shit, man. Oh. Like, and, that, and that's... Oh, shit. Oh, <laughs> oh no. <laughs> oh, no. I was in the lead. I was firmly in the lead, and I just <laughs> double. Oh no! You can't close just like this movie, according to that one reviewer. Oh, oh my, my god. god! Where yo, it's literally tied at five. I was like, oh, I got a two, 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 two curse lead. You know how like in an NBA game where one team is up twenty, and then the other team makes a huge comeback, and it's in the fourth quarter, and they finally tie it up in a few minutes ago. It's like it's a new game, ladies and gentlemen. Now we got ourselves a ball game. That's what just happened right now. Except it's not the fourth quarter. Gosh darn it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Park car opens their door. Suddenly Mark swerves to avoid it. Lights and siren come on. He changed lanes without signaling. He makes a mistake before that. Never, ever, ever turn around in your seat. I don't care if you're a passenger or the driver. You can check the mirrors all you want. Do not turn your entire body around and look out your back window because that's when they know they got you. Just in case either of you want to go in a blackface one day and get followed by a cop. What if I wore it on the entire train trip? Blackface? Yeah. I'm, I'm with it. I'm so with it. <laughs> I'm 100% with it. All right. Gives a registration. His license is obviously the white version of him. So then he doesn't give it. Says he lost his license. What are you going to do? Arrest me for losing my license? He gets arrested. Cut two. He's terrified in jail with a bunch of uh, beat up white sports fans. They look like Celtics fans. Led by MC Ganey, who I think was also in the fan. Repeat offender. Yep, absolutely. MC Ganey, I, I don't remember his album. Fans are racist. They dropped the N word. Ah, ah, hot ah. Ah, they said it. They said it. <laughs> Cut to Mark running through the school, trying to get to class. He tries to sneak in. He's real beaten up. He tries to explain what happened. James dislikes interruptions in his class. As class gets out, Mark doesn't give him his paper. James calls him out. Says he spent 18 hours in jail uh, without charges, got pummeled by drunken bigots. James Earl Jones says no excuses. Mark thinks he could understand. No special treatment. Worked twice as hard as these little white bleeps. Little white what? Bleeps. He gives him an extension after all this, which is pretty soft of Professor Vader here. Yeah, and and then gives him his phone number. Like, hey, next time you find yourself in with the one phone call, Tension? call me. Tension. Oh, that's why not. Man, I'll wait nice. for him to finish the line <laughs> nice, so I could drop tension. 
He's eating an awful TV dinner while working on his paper. Montage of him going through it. Elevator with Lady grabbing her purse tighter. He's working. He sees Sarah asleep in the library. She's late to class. His all-nighter montage is set to Louis Armstrong Black and Blue, which contains the lyric, I'm white inside, but that don't help my case, which is surprisingly apt for this movie. Future callback. He sits down at a table, and there's a black kid coloring. Kid is Sarah's. She takes him away. White guys telling racist jokes. Why did the Negro wear a tux on his way to his vasectomy? Why? Because if I'm going to be impotent, I might as well look impotent. <laughs> Got the glass. James wants a citation from Sarah. Mark steps in. James scolds him. After class, he tells her she needs an A. Mark chases after her outside the building. He offers to study with her. What was her grade? She got an A earlier, so how bad could her grade have gotten from that assignment to this? She's struggling, man. But you see that she's falling asleep. She's working hard, man. See, her grades are going down, and Mark's grades are going up. That's what happened in that montage. Single mom? Of course she has a kid, right? Whoa, whoa. That's racist. You know, it was just, no, that's, yeah, exactly. That's racist of the movie. Like, let's oh, okay. make the black one have a kid, right? And then the other thing is, while he's waiting for her, what the hell is he doing with his shoe? I don't know. I don't know why his shoe was off. Like, his shoe was off, and he's digging inside it. It's not like trying to get a pebble out of there. He's, like, digging in his shoe, and I'm like, what are you doing? She shows up and quizzes him. Now we have a studying montage of them helping each other. He falls asleep, walking together, Horrible. talking, studying. Suddenly Horrible it's magic. R&B song. Yeah. Suddenly it's magic. When you fall in love. <laughs> they sneak into the library with drinks. Suddenly it's magic. She's flirting with him a little. She has to leave because the kid's sick. He offers to drive her. Uh, she says no. She's seen him drive before. Now she's driving his car. And I wrote, this is a long montage. And she's driving terribly. Wow. If I were Mark, I would be really, really, really scared. Two black people in a car and one of them, the one who's driving, is driving erratically. Yes. At night in Boston, we're about to die. I've had girlfriends before where I am terrified when they drive my car. How's Erin when she drives? She's never driven my car, but when she drives her car, like she's a good driver. So why hasn't she driven your car? Because I usually just drive. Because you're a misogynist. I make her open the door for me. Oh, that, yeah, that doesn't sound misogynistic <laughs> at all. You're right. Chivalry. Way, way to clear that up. <laughs> uh, they pull up to her grandparents' house. She's got a letter from her parents. Dad writes her every week about how proud he is. They say Mark's parents must be proud of him, too. Mark's people. Mark's people, I'm parents. sorry. His people. Because, you know, some black people don't have parents. Oh. <laughs> That's what the writers <laughs> of this movie felt like. No, no. Say his people. It'll make it more authentic. Her kid wants to watch Johnny Carson. Joan Rivers is hosting. She says no. Parenting scene. How does he know who Johnny Carson or Joan Rivers are? It's like he's four. four. Yeah. He's four years old. Also, uh, do you know what the name the name of that actor is? No. It's Jonathan Fudge Leonard. <laughs> He starred in Soul Man. Fudge! He's what? been in a couple episodes of Highway to Heaven. What? And a couple episodes of a TV show called The Women of Brewster Place. Fudge! And a TV movie called Playing With Fire. Shout out to Fudge. Jonathan Fudge Leonard. Sarah's telling a story about someone asking about food stamps when she was at a checkout counter once. We find out she was married two years. He says that he has no great romances in his past. She asks about Whitney. He says, that's history. She looks outside. It's snowing. They go outside. She falls into the snow. He helps her up. They kiss. <laughs> Look at you. <laughs> You're turning white. <laughs> we find out she's from San Diego. He's from L.A. She says that he's the one that stole her scholarship. But she's glad that it was him. Okay, so this is, I know we're supposed to suspend this belief or whatever. But the scholarship clearly said Los Angeles. Well, but she explains. If no one in L.A. gets it, they open it up to all to the entire state. That doesn't sound right at all. That I don't know of any scholarship that works that way. It was the eighties. Why would there be a scholarship so specific to just Los Angeles though? Because people from LA do that. Or they'll do Southern California. They don't say, Hey, it's specific to this place, and if not then we open up to the entire state. Why would you have a scholarship that if no one qualifies for it, you just say, well, tear it up. Well, that's the other part of the racist part of this movie. Mark claims that only one black person from the entire Los Angeles area applied to Harvard and got in. Harvard Law. Harvard Law. Yes. Only one black person? Really? Black History Month, you're right. Yeah. You're right. Yes, exactly. And also, this proves my point. Yes, master. Damn, bro. Well <laughs> Damn, bro, you could, 
Maze, what are you what are you doing, man? Look at you, you're turning white. <laughs> Now Mark is guilty. Gord's trying to talk him down. I had no right. It's wrong. It's immoral. It took this for you to figure this out, Mark. And he agrees it's immoral. Mark is going to turn himself in. The girl I want to have sex with could have had a scholarship, but instead she's working in the cafeteria where her, her four-year-old does homework and talks to strangers. It's finally real for him. What have I done? Gordon tries to stop him. I run. how are there 40 minutes left? <laughs> Julia and her boyfriend see the scholarship plaque with Mark's name on it. Mark is in James' office. James talking about the plaque ju- position. <laughs> <laughs> James is talking about the Judiciary Committee punitive actions that they take. Sometimes, sometimes it's a student suing another student. Sometimes it's a felony fraud. Why is Professor Bader leading with all of this unnecessary detail? Because we're supposed to make him think that oh, he knows that Mark's been doing this. Supposed to make him think that he's going to kick him out. Right. It's a miscommunication. Mark thought he was on to him. James is trying to get him on the committee. Because he's the only black student. And I said, what about Sarah? <laughs> also, there's another black woman in that class. In the that front row. Yeah. In the front row. <laughs> Very misogynistic, Professor Vader. He's impressed by his improvement. We'll write his recommendation. Now, Julia and Brad run into Mark. She screams to tell. Hi, Kareem. Tell Gordon. <laughs> they say hi. He gives a sign language. It means your nose is happy like the moon. Mark gets home and tells Gordon he didn't tell James the truth. Gordon says to go to his room. Whitney's in there on his bed. Mark's freaking out. Sarah's going to be there soon to study. Gordon keeps talking about the golden rule. Whitney wants to work on world peace by staying together, wants a chance, understands what his people have been through. He says that she has no idea what his people have been through. She's kind of acting her ass off in this scene, Jan Levinson Gould. She is. Gosh, if two young, intelligent, sexually compatible people can't work out their differences, what hope is there for lasting world peace? Who gives a shit? Oh, again, again. Thank you. Tells, <laughs> tells her to stay there as the, we hear the doorbell buzz. You have no idea what my people have been through. <laughs> Gordon's trying to get him uh, to get rid of Whitney by saying he's white. This scene, this scene is so dumb. This scene is just, it turns into a sitcom. But this is great dialogue. What can I tell her? What? Don't tell her anything. But I already told her. What, that you're white? No, that I'm not seeing Whitney. Well, does Whitney know you're white? No, I gotta get rid of her. Well, how are you gonna get rid of her? I'll tell her I'm white. Well, don't tell her you're white. You're right. I can't tell her I'm white. What am I gonna tell her? Wait a minute. You need to think. Let me think. Mark, why don't you let us in? Gordon stalls his parents. Mark tells Whitney to get dressed. Parents walk into the apartment. He walks out in a full ski mask, completely bundled up. Says he's wearing it because of germs. COVID precursor. Mark takes his parents into the kitchen. Sarah walks in. Mark comes out without the ski mask, asks if she wants to go to the library. She thought they were studying there. He changed his mind. Studying there makes him sleepy. She gave the number to her grandparents, says she'll make coffee. He screams no, puts the mask back on, and is back in the kitchen. So the dad does this amazing thing where (laughs) it happened in the first scene. It happens a bunch in this scene here. Every time the mom says anything... He immediately, automatically goes, shut up, Dorothy. Mark, uh, could we uh, go somewhere? Like, he just, he slips in shut up, Dorothy, into the beginning yeah. of every sentence. Right. Whitney's looking at records in his room. Mark is back in the kitchen, runs out, takes the mask off for Sarah as they hear music in his he room. He does that quick, by the way. Yeah, real quick. The mask unmasking is yeah, ninja quick. pretty good. Also, when he came out, they heard the music. The music was, I wish they could all be California girls by the Beach Boys. And she says, I hear music from your room. He says, no, that's not my room. Beach Boys suck. But my thing is this. How did she know that was his room? Oh, yeah. I don't think she's been there, right? Well, I guess maybe in the montage. That's true. I guess so. He walks back into the kitchen without the mask and says he's armed and he's warning him. Get back, Dorothy. I'll handle this. My next note is Mark speaks offensively. What's happening, brother? Get down. Get down. Looking good, mama. Looking good. Well, I got to be going now. Did he have a knife? I think he had a knife. Yeah, this is uh, somehow his first terrible jive talking. No, it's not. Of the movie. Right on was, was one that he did earlier. Right on. Oh, you're saying like when he gets to the class? Yeah. This was way worse, though. This was way worse, but that was also really good. Gordon says that he thinks Sarah's on to him. To tell her the truth. Gordon says Mark bought her Christmas present and she'll ruin the surprise if she goes in there. She feels terrible because she hasn't gotten him a gift yet. I'm like, 
what are we talking about? Mark walks in, the, in his room, puts Whitney on the fire escape. That's when the landlord sees her out there. Well, Gordo is taking pictures on a Polaroid camera of Jan's ass. Yes, that's also true. When he picks her up, she goes, ooh, where are we going? <laughs> I love that. They hear something in the kitchen. Sarah asks if someone's in there. He says no. That's when Mark's parents walk out. He asks how they got in this kitchen. Mom introduces herself to Sarah as Mark's parents. Gordon tries to explain to Sarah that these people are total lunatics, accosting a young professional student due to financial issues, result of the Reagan budget cuts. Yeah, Gordo's trying the Ben Stiller school of lying, of just being very detail-oriented, and he's slightly better than Mark at lying, but they're both abysmal. Yeah. They're both terrible. Gordon tries to shoo them out. Sarah wants to speak to Mark in his room. Landlord calls Mr. Dunbar. Mark says he likes her, so he can't tell her the truth. Then asks how she feels about interracial relationships. Pardon me? <laughs> then Whitney comes back through the window. Great timing. Sarah's walking out. Mark says shut up to his dad when uh, he says stand back. There he is again! <laughs> stand back. Stand back, Dorothy. <laughs> shut up, dad. <laughs> Mark tries to explain being white or black. He was really white on the inside, although he was black on the outside. But now a part of him is black on the inside, even though he's white on the outside. He says he's actually white. Maybe he's gray on the inside and the outside. Mom, Dad, there's something I have to tell you. I'm black. Dunbar pulls up in the car as Sarah's storming out. He punches Mark in the stomach, and the landlord evicts him. Sarah says, you're crazy. She storms out. Mark chases after her. And Gordo says, Kids! <laughs> I like that line, man. Yo, Gordo really won me over. I was like, you know what? This guy's got timing. I mean, he's an incredibly loyal best friend who seems to have no agenda of his own. <laughs> Brad's looking up the scholarship history now. Cut to James in the class giving the final exam out. Mark tells Sarah good luck. Final exam taking montage. Ticking clock. There's a weird, like, totally academic song in here. I don't know if you guys noticed that. Oh. Oh. What seems like years later... Bradley discovers that the Bouchard Award is for black people and raises an eyebrow. No, but he also, when he was walking past the plaque, if you've ever seen these plaques in colleges or whatever, it'd be like someone who won this or someone who won that or whatever. And they'll keep adding the names on little brass nameplates. But unless you're really staring at it, you really can't read those names. This dude caught it out of the corner of his eye and stared hard, like, how dare Mark, and it's the only time we've seen his middle name, Mark Pelfrey Watson, win whatever award this is. So he decided to do research based on that. My suspicion of this belief was really stretched thin, but unfortunately for that scene, I was more intrigued by the music. Totally academic as a it's song. Totally Ma academic. <laughs> Mays, I command you as please. Black History Month, please oh. clip that song. Watches Sarah walk away. He's only got nine more commandments. He called me master. Uh, Gordon asks Mark what he's going to do. Master and commander is not a future cinephobe, unfortunately. He never thought he'd fall in love with her. Never thought about anything. Gordon asks if he really hates the Beach Boys now. Hard to say. I guess I still like some of their funkier stuff. Uh, do they have funky songs? They don't. I mean, do you like the Beach Boys? Uh, <laughs> No. <laughs> Special Judiciary Committee hearing. But I did laugh at how Gordo really like felt hurt by that. Yeah. Like, you really hit the Beach Boys? Also, he's holding a rubber basketball. It's clear this dude, this goes back to the basketball scene. You don't like basketball. You don't play basketball. Why are you showing up to pick up to play basketball? And then why do you have a basketball in your in your house? But this is how I know he's not good at basketball. And I don't know if this is great writing or they just didn't know any better. He's got a rubber basketball. Yeah, that's just like... And everyone knows, RBBF, rubber balls break fingers. You don't know that? RBBF? You never heard that? Never heard that. You never really played with a rubber ball before. Not like when you were like 14? Chill out, little junior. <laughs> I've never played with a rubber ball. You've never played... Zach, when you were 10, you didn't play with a rubber basketball? No, we always had a basketball. Oh, my God. Oh, sorry. I went to Catholic school. Okay, Mark Watson. Sorry, we had a budget. Sounds privileged to me. Yeah, super privileged. White privilege. Sorry, brother. <laughs> is it, is it, wait, wait, did your it? rubber balls have a attitude direction? I mean, what did the racist guy say at the end of it? Like, 
Sorry, man. You know, it's just uh, no offense. Oh, no offense. No offense. That's what you're supposed to say, there, Zach. No offense. No offense. Students are speculating. Basketball organizers are taking bets on what happened. Whitney is with, I guess, a Native American? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then she says, there's no white or red, just shades of pink. A Native American? She walked in with my man John Redcorn from King of the Hill. (laughs) This is when we learn that the racist jokester is named Barky and his friend is named Bowie. And they actually have a scene without a racist joke. I thought it was progress, but no. Not so much. Meeting started. Mark hasn't shown up. Gordon barges in as representation for Mark. Gordon gives some opening remarks. Uh, huge injustice taking the scholarship, set the record straight. Full reparations for the damage he's done to the person who should have received the scholarship and the institution he deceived and society whose laws he transgressed. This scene right here has so many Easter eggs. Yeah. Like when he says reparations, I'm like, oh my God. This is just like the new scene with the, the tan cabbage patch doll. And then he goes on and he just keeps piling on and on about this. I kind of thought he was opening, remarking his ass off. Like, he was he was going for it. I bet you did. Legal drama scene. Gordon is blaming his environment. We can't blame him for the color of his skin. Trust the committee will find the heart, nay, the soul for his client. Yeah, so important. Hope he becomes a productive member of the society. Can we blame him, ladies and gentlemen? For the color of his skin? Calls Mark Watson down, and he's his white self again. Yeah, he does the price is right. Come on down! Everybody's shocked. No wonder. Brad comes in with proof that he's white as he sees Mark in his uh, normal form. Great movie for Bradley, dude. Still at BU. (laughs) Sarah storms out. Now Mark is in James' office. More Professor Vader crazy eyes. Mm. Mark wants to pay Sarah the grant plus interest, wants to volunteer one day of the week and all of his summer vacations to legal aid work in the black community. Wants a contract drawn up to donate a fixed percentage of his annual income toward a scholarship in the name of Sarah Walker. When did he make all of these soul-revealing epiphanies? Just when the girl that he wanted to bang yes. turned out to be the one? Yes. Well, he's a soul man. That's one. And then two, I realized now that I had a joke I wanted to do throughout the entire pod that I completely forgot about. Which was, every time we would say Harvard, I want to say, do you mean Harvard? Because that's how Professor Vader says, Harvard, and this Harvard Law graduates have power. Thanks for making reparations for not making that joke the entire time during the podcast. He'd also like to get a law degree to do the work that uh, might be of use to someone. James says he learned what it's like to, to be black. A Harvard Law graduate can do a great many things, make a lot of money. Teach, become a senator, a judge, a Harvard Law graduate, has power, Mr. Watson, and with great power comes great responsibility. He says, no, sir. I don't know what it feels like, sir. If I didn't like it, I could always get out. I wrote, message! (laughs) Exactly. Even the black man, Professor Vader, is thrown off. Oh! Professor Vader, secretly super soft. (laughs) You thought about race relations in a way that I, a 65-year-old black man, had never thought of. Who had gotten to be a law professor at Harvard Law School. You taught me something, white man. But you've learned something that I can't teach them. You've learned what it feels like to be black. James says he's learned a great deal more than he thought. Won't press charges. Sarah's scared to open her grades with her son in the cafeteria. Mark is working uh, as they're sitting in. Walks over to their table. George says... You look funny, White. Yeah. Mark says green's his best color, but everybody stares. Kid laughs. Shout out to Fudge Leonard. Fudge. <laughs> <laughs> he explains the situation. Now, do you think he got his nickname in a non-racist way? No chance. <laughs> in Hollywood? <laughs> Working on Soul Man. That's what they- <laughs> Hey, Fudge! <laughs> I have this idea of like, hey, we got to shoot this scene. Like, ah, where's that little black kid? Where's the, where's the, uh, fudge! fudge get him over here! Hey, fudge! No, because here's the thing, because James Earl Jones and Ray Don Chong are rather light-skinned. And so was the guy that played at the, in the pickup game. Yeah, Leon. He was light-skinned, too. So really, the darkest person in this movie is Fudge. <laughs> <laughs> this is a great month. He explains the situation to stay at school. He stops her from leaving. She's going to open the grades. She got an A. And it hits her that she passed. He can use a study partner because he got an A-. minus. Sarah, you never answered my question about how you feel about interracial relationships. What a terrible callback. She shakes her head. He asked what she was going to say. I was going to say I've never met a white man I was interested in. And then I guess the experience is just too different. Speaking of callbacks, Barky and Boo, you're back. Yep. She gets up to take the kid out. They come in. 
laugh at the kid, tell another joke. He punches both of them. They go flying across the room into tables. I think this is the worst one. Says no offense. This wasn't a good joke. Like, this is the one I was like. What was it? It was, uh, what do you call a black test tube baby? It's a janitor and oil drum or something like that. I was like, that shit wasn't funny. But I'm going to tell you why I still laughed heartily in this scene. Because the the punches. Oh, my God. Yeah. He, <laughs> what is <laughs> like the Hulk? What is this punch? I think my favorite part is that he punches Bowie, the guy who's laughing first. Punch the guy who makes the jokes first. He's the asshole. Bowie's just an uh, idiot. Uh, the rotation. The down. pork. The t- yeah. Oh, did he? Oh, did he? Oh, wow. Oh. Go. Uh, now oh. I'm the snitch. No. No, mark it down. <laughs> mark it down. He swore. <laughs> I'm just helping my brother out. Uh, no offense. Uh, that was the best. That was the best finisher to that. And they respected wait, it. Wait, 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 But he walks away <laughs> and Leon, the basketball player, is yeah. nodding his head. Yeah. yeah. Leon. Respect. He's good for basketball and lunch, apparently. Mark walks out. <laughs> Never seen him in class. <laughs> Sarah walks after him. I guess it's all right about inter- interracial relationships. If two people really care about each other. Right, George? I'm like, what the hell? Like, why is, who cares what the kid thinks? One more Mark shit eating grin. Yeah, mark it down. She offers to buy him dinner. That's another callback. And then they kind of just leave the kid and he's got to catch up. Sarah, this is Harvard. I don't have to eat. I don't have to sleep. I just have to study. Roll credits. Yeah. Suddenly it's magic. <laughs> C. Thomas Howell and Ray Don Chong met on the set of this film, married, and later divorced. Yeah, married in 1989, divorced in 1990. So, oh. solid, solid marriage. They got married? They got married like three years later and then divorced a year after that. Can't trust them, white devils. C. Thomas Howell is somebody's Eskimo brother. <laughs> You're my Eskimo brother. <laughs> Wait a second, no. What? No, 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 no. <laughs> Tim Robbins was originally cast in the lead but dropped out when the filming of Howard the Duck went over schedule. Future Cinefo. Absolutely. How about that? Ralph Macchio turned it down. I'm now imagining Ralph Macchio in blackface. So uh So He would have been the American Ninja. <laughs> In the scene where Mark first approaches Gordon as a black man, Gordon was originally supposed to believe Mark was going to mug him. An entire scene was filmed in which Mark played along with it and made Gordon sing Sweet Low, Sweet Chariot. Oh my God. It was taken out because it was thought that although funny when filmed, it was inappropriate and racist. That was the line. That part was inappropriate and racist, huh? The fact that they had standards for this movie is (laughs) mind-blowing. You've gone too far. Reminds me of Zach sometimes. What? What? So Ray Dong Chong claims that it was only a controversy over the blackface because of Spike Lee. He'd never seen the movie and he just jumped all over it. He was just starting and pulling everything down in his wake. If you watch the movie, it's really making white people look stupid. The film is adorable and it didn't deserve it. Spike Lee responded by saying, in my film career, any comment or criticism has never been based on jealousy. What? In defending the film, producer Steve Tisch said it was like Tootsie which featured a man masquerading as a woman for career advancement. No. It used comedy as a device to expose sexual stereotyping. I think Soul Man uses it to explode racial stereotyping. Did he mean to say explode? Or did he mean to say expose again? I don't know. Whoa. (laughs) See, Thomas Howell said, a white man donning blackface is taboo. Conversation over. You can't win. But our intentions were pure. We wanted to make a funny movie that had a message about racism. He later expanded, I'm shocked at how truly harmless that movie is and how the anti-racial message involved in it is so prevalent. This isn't a movie about blackface. This isn't a movie that should be considered irresponsible on any level. It's very funny. It made me much more aware of the issues we face on a day-to-day basis. And it made me much more sensitive to racism. This is C. Thomas Howell saying this? Yes. C. Thomas Howell in an AV Club interview, February 2013. When he was 11, my son hadn't seen Soul Man and wanted to see it, so we put it on and watched it together. This was relatively recently, and I'm shocked at how truly harmless this movie is, how the anti-racial message involved in it is so prevalent. But I still don't understand, and I guess it's just my own ignorance, the fact that certain people really hate the whole blackface idea, because this isn't a movie about blackface. The whole blackface idea. This isn't a movie that should be considered irresponsible on any level. This is a movie that is quite the opposite for me. 
And I think a lot of people that have seen the movie feel the same way. But there's a lot more judgment about the movie from the people that haven't seen the movie, who are like, a white kid paints himself black and goes through this experience? How could you do this horrible thing? But it's not like I'm Al Jolson in blackface singing Mammy. Oh, my God. I understand that that oh could God. be seen as very offensive and even irresponsible. But Soul Man, it's 180 degrees from that. It's an innocent movie. It's got innocent messages. And it's got some very, very deep messages. And I think the people that haven't seen it that judge it are horribly wrong. I think that's more offensive than anything. Judging something you haven't seen is the worst thing you can really do. He's really raising Jake Johnson's philosophy up a level here. I think it's a really innocent movie with a very powerful message, and it's an important part of my life. I'm proud of the performance, and I'm proud of the people that were in it. I like this. A lot of people ask me today, could that movie be made today? Robert Downey Jr. just did it in Tropic Thunder. The difference is that he was just playing a character in Tropic Thunder, and there was no magnifying glass on racism, which is so prevalent in our country. I guess that's what makes people uncomfortable about Soul Man, but I think it's an important movie. He thinks that's what makes people uncomfortable about Soul Man? Yeah, not the dinner scene. Zach, we didn't ask this question earlier. Why the hell did you pick this? I tried to pick Passenger 57. What? Yeah. Then why'd you pick this? Well, I picked it as a joke, and you guys made me do it. Oh, that's... And I wasn't going to disagree with you, I mean. Black History Month. That's a real funny joke, Zach. It's still January, by the way, when we're recording this, so I don't know why you felt the need to, to be compelled to make this joke. I don't know why you let me. Oh, so now it's the black man's fault that you picked the wrong movie. The Reagans enjoyed the film. I bet they did. <laughs> yeah, their son was in it. No. NAACP chapter president Willis Edwards said in a statement at the time, we certainly believe it is possible to use humor to reveal the ridiculousness of racism. However, the unhumorous and quite seriously made plot point of Soul Man is that no black student could be found in all of Los Angeles who was academically qualified for a scholarship geared to blacks. There you go, man. I just want to point out there's only one person on this podcast that had that reaction to that plot point. And it wasn't the non-black guys. Also, won't lie, at one point in this movie, I did try to imagine both of you guys in blackface. <laughs> How'd that go? Not well. Would I have to have no beard? No, the beard helps, I think. But Oh, the beard helps? Okay. Ultimately, like, I thought, because I thought about both of you in blackface and a Jerry Curl wig, like what C. Thomas Howell did. Oh, yeah, we didn't even mention the wig. Yeah, no, the Jerry Curl wig is terrible. Oh, my like, God. Like, he would have been better off just getting it cut down low. No, I, I'm trying to think who would better pass. Neither of you really would. No, of course not. I kind of feel like, oh, man. No. Which one of you guys would better pass in black? Uh, <laughs> Why are you asking I don't think us? So. I don't what? think so. I mean, not today, my friend. Call Admiral Akbar if a drop. Not today. <laughs> Golden Dumpster yeah, nominee. Please, let's get this over with. Well, I mainly eat out of a dumpster. <laughs> <laughs> I should try that. I need some new dresses. Don't. <laughs> Or if you do, stay away from the one in Ocean and Wilshire. That's mine. Seriously. Stay out of it. James Sicking, Mark's dad, using the inversion table and talking about spending his law school money on a timeshare in Barbados. Apparently the POV shot that was super cool, according to me. I liked it. Max Wright, a.k.a. Alf's dad, Dr. Aronson, the therapist, going off on his son, saying he wants to fuck his wife. Oh. Yeah, it is. All right. Yeah, whatever. What do you say, Zach? Zach, what do you say? F his wife. What was that? Fornicate his wife, but he used a swear word. I mean, but that's not, that's not, yeah, okay. Maisie used a swear during the golden dumpster section. Gordo running off a of pier backwards. Just the concept of tanning pills from our guy, the Australian stoner with a PhD in biotech. See Thomas Howell's blank eating grins and overall smugness. During this entire movie, the part where Gordo takes Mark's banana, dunks it in coffee, and then eats it. Mark's Stevie Wonder impression. Jan from The Office saying she could feel 400 years of oppression <laughs> when Mark humped her. <laughs> the racist visions during Mark's dinner at the Dunbar's. Oh my god, you just named the whole movie. <laughs> Mark's dad automatically saying, shut up Dorothy every time the mom speaks. <laughs> And Mark punching Barky oh. and Bowie <laughs> with the force of a thousand hammers. Or the force of 400 years of, yeah, of oppression. 
I mean, by all means, please go first. <laughs> this is going to sound bad. It's the joke that Barky and the other one says. It says, how many black electricians to screw in a light bulb, one to hold the bulb, and one to drive the pink Cadillac in a tight circle? I, I, I laugh so hard. I love racist jokes. I'm going to go with, I'm going to go, oh man, I don't even know what to go with here. It all feels like a trap. I'm going to go with the Beach Boys joke. The disappointment in Gordon. Oh, yeah. Do you really hate the Beach Boys? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm going with that. Gordon and the Beach Boys. Maze? I really did love the scene where Jan is talking about 400 years of oppression, but I'm going to go with Mark's dad automatically saying, shut up, Dorothy, because that, that killed me. That was a recurring bit that just absolutely killed me. That was a good one. All right, I picked it. What'd you pick? mf -er. Damn it, Maze. Let me allow me to set the trap a little. <laughs> I mean, what do you what do you think you're gonna do? No, you picked it though. Okay. Well, I got a phobe it. I, I have. I mean, it's Black History Month. How, even if, if, even if I wanted to file it, which I don't, this is a movie that is. So, uh, what, what I'm hearing is that you want to file it. No, 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 no. I don't want to file it. I I laughed at a couple of points in this in this movie, mm -hmm. but I would never watch this again. Can, like, can this you give is, me some some specific criticisms of why you would never watch this movie again? I just think it's wildly offensive. It does a horrible job on touching. You were offended on the issues of race. You were offended. <laughs> I was offended. I didn't know you could get offended. If I were black, I'd be offended. This did it. Yeah. No. This is a this is an easy phobe. I can't believe it's available to rent. That's how bad it is. Like I was, I thought Maze was gonna have to send us like a Google link or something. Well, David Caruso wasn't in this movie, so <laughs> it's a it's a phobe. It's for available. Me. I mean, what are, what about you, phobe or file? I'm going phobe, but not because oh, I was offended God. by the the. <laughs> by the I should have gone file <laughs> just just to really throw a wrench in it. <laughs> And I would have filed it. And then you said, no, it's a trap. It's a phobe. And then I would have been. <laughs> no, I, I, I phobe it. And not because I was offended. It's just because it wasn't good, man. Yeah, like, it's not good. Like Other than like the couple of scenes with the banter with Gordo and obviously <laughs> Barky. Barky and Bowie. Barky and Bowie. Barky and Bowie. Just one of the guys. That's a good version of this. Like that's a that's a movie I would absolutely watch again. This didn't do it. Maze, what do you got? I'm just going to take a moment to point out how similar this movie is to Teen Wolf 2. Whoa. Where the racism Whoa. is disguised under the premise that he's a werewolf. Whoa. <laughs> and we all filed it. <laughs> and on. this movie does blackface. Uh-oh. And it's terrible. Maze, you're playing a dangerous game right now. I'm not playing any type of game. Yeah, it's a phobe. A dangerous game. We're phobing this. Phobe sweep. Black History Month can't abide a single positive thing to say about Soul Man. But I like the therapist scene. I like Jan. She was funny to me. There was some funny parts of this, but the premise sinks it. Phobe. Sweep. Maze, what's the next pick? We're going back to Harvard, boys. Harvard. Harvard. With how high? Woo! So high that I can touch the sky. Up to the sky. How sick. Do some more lyrics, Zach. So sick that you could suck my... Next time we make love, you introduce me to Jade. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I win the Curse Wars. What were the numbers, Amin? Read us the numbers. All right. I've got five curse words in here. <laughs> no, I don't think that's accurate. Yeah, no, it is accurate. Zach had six. That last D word he really did it. And <laughs> I Maze. I talking about <laughs> Nick Jenkins, the actor. You mean when he had the D in his mouth? Yeah, that really did curse it. The what in my mouth? Maze. Maze. Eight. But the funny thing is that Maze, you, you had a big lead at one point, and then all of a sudden you just start 
leaping left and right. Yeah, because I have them in my notes because they're either quotes or things that I said. So did I, other than my S-bombs. What am I supposed to say? S-word? F? Oh my god, dude, I had the same swear word too. (laughs) I mean, you're so forking annoying, dude. Shut up, you mother lovers. Yo, Rob. Yo, I mean. What's the biggest complaint I always have whenever we record these podcasts? Besides Jerv being too sleepy, um, I think it's you forget <laughs> to name a couple of things. You always want to talk about some extra stuff. Oh, man. It's the worst feeling in the world. When we get done and we say cut and I'm sending the files to Rob and I say, shit, I forgot we were going to talk about this topic or that topic. Well, guess what? We're not going to have those problems anymore. If you go ahead and download the stereo app that's right go to stereo.com slash darth amin and make sure you are linked and subscribe to us and we're going to talk about all of the different things that i always forget about this is a great app every time you guys are listening to this pod you say oh i wish i could chime in but you're listening to our pod you can never chime in it's pre-recorded guess what with stereo you're able to to have your voice heard. You can ask real-time questions about either the pod episode we recorded or whatever we're talking about at the time. It's great. It's a forum for you to listen to your favorite podcasters. That'll be me and our, yours truly all at the Count the Things Network. And we're going to be out here. We're going to do this regularly, multiple times a week. Just hop on stereo. Download the app. Subscribe, follow Darth the Mean, follow Talk Hoops, follow Trayvon, follow Big Waz, all of us. You know who we are. You search for us on the stereo app, you will find us and subscribe to us and be a part of these conversations real time. Have the ability to ask the questions that you want to ask. Stop us when we're on some bullshit, as we are frequently. And of course, catch some content that goes above and beyond what you listen to in the podcast you already love again that is the stereo app and you can follow me stereo.com slash darth amin you can look up everybody else by their handles their handles are all the same as what we have on social media you can join us multiple times a week i love stereo i'm on the app talking all the time follow me and get notified every time i go live